This is the Seagate Exos Portable. It holds 106 drives over two petabytes of storage in just this system alone. We're back in the Cincinnati lab, a little bit quieter to have this conversation about the Seagate Exos Core Vault platform. What's special about the Seagate Exos Core Vault isn't just the 106 drives. JBots have been around forever, and even Seagate has many other just straight JBot offerings. But with the controllers involved here, you get so many more data features than you would out of a traditional JBOD. It's almost like a sand light or a smart JBOD, but it's some sort of tweener device that does more than a JBOD, a little less than a SAN, but still gives you so much more data protection than traditional JBOD solutions do. Now, while most people know Seagate as the hard drive company and now Flash in modern days, Seagate's been at the storage array business for quite some time. Previously, that was under the badge Dot Hill, a company they acquired many years ago, and also Xyratex, who's been making chassis for enterprise storage solutions for a very long time as well. Combined though, they've got a long history of ASIC technology and programming and firmware and everything that goes into that bundle when it comes to storage controllers. These controllers show up in Seagate storage solutions that are branded, but also in partner solutions like the Dell ME platform and HPE's MSA. Powering the Seagate Exos Core Vault system are Seagate's 6th gen Velo CT ASIC-based architecture and controllers. This provides the dual active-active availability and the seamless data management that ensures HA and minimizes any possible downtime. Serviceability and uptime is a major benefit of the Exos Core Vault and is the fundamental trait that this giant system provides. But it's not just the hardware uptime and availability that drives the biggest value out of the system. That comes from something else called ADAPT. In addition, there's another component called Autonomous Drive Regeneration, or ADR. So with ADR, what that means is that the individual hard drive can have a component failure, maybe a head or a, or a platter. So if we think about a 10 platter hard drive and something happens to one platter, Seagate can fail that platter in the hard drive, bring it back into the array, and at 90% capacity, it can still provide useful service. Or it lets you coordinate field replacements so that you don't have to do it as drives or components fail, you could schedule it and say every 60 or 90 or 120 days, service multiple drives across multiple core vaults if something's gone wrong. Talking about hard drives, Seagate sells the Exos Core Vault completely full, and today that's 18 or 20 terabyte uh, hard drive capacities. 22s will be there soon if they're not actually already by the time we've made this video, but Seagate's already announced the plan to release 30 terabyte hammer hard drives later this year. When those come out, Core Vault will pick that up, and now we're talking about a system that can support more than three petabytes in a single 4U chassis. But what's more is, as these drives continue to increase in capacity, should you want to keep older drives operating in a core vault, you can continue to do that. You can mix capacities, and a lot of that comes down to the smart data placement in ADAPT, the erasure coding, that lets Seagate get really smart about data placement, where they put things, and how they address the individual drives within the core vault chassis. With a chassis this dense, there's a couple concerns when it comes to the hard drives. One is around thermals. We have to be really careful to make sure those drives get proper cooling so that they operate in peak condition. The other is acoustics. We don't want any rattling or shaking or unnecessary vibrations within the chassis. Seagate has addressed both of these in the design and engineering of the platform with a bunch of creative solutions along the way. Acoustic Shield reduces performance degradation by up to 90% by removing the line of sight from fan to drive and dampens the overall acoustic energy. An example of this is when you remove the rear fan modules, you can see the rear baffles. This helps optimize airflow over the entire system. Another thing that's interesting to think about is how drives and spare space is allocated in Exos Core Vault. So each controller actually addresses 53 of the drives within the system. There is no notion of hot spare in this architecture. Instead, that sparing capacity is allocated and determined during setup and configuration of the pool. In the event of a failure, data from that drive is distributed amongst other drives in that pool, and then that's where ADR comes in to try to take that drive out of rotation, repair it, and put it back in. This is one of the key advantages Seagate has in this platform. By being dynamic, being able to use erasure coding, they can use so much more of the capacity without having to have a bunch of hot spares sitting idle waiting to be called into duty. 
So we've spent a bunch of time talking about the hardware around Seagate Exos Corval, and that's because we're hardware nerds. But fundamentally, getting operational is a big value prop of Exos Corval as well. Anyone that's used prior Seagate solutions, the UI and interface is going to look very similar to other things that you've seen out of Seagate or even the old Dot .hill days. So now Kevin's gonna walk us through an abbreviated view of how the Seagate Exos Core Vault gets provisioned and deployed, just to give you a feel for what that looks like, how it feels, and how simple that entire process is. So we got our Seagate Exos Core Vault uh, racked, and now we're gonna start its initial setup. And this process goes pretty easily. You'll create a uh, default username and password and uh, kind of move through the initial configuration. So after that process is uh, complete, uh, we next go to the uh, initial provisioning stage. This is where it collects information in the box. You can uh, see what is currently installed in, ter in terms of firmware. You can also go out to the uh, Seagate website and pull down the uh, newest firmware for this uh, uh, Array. So that, that gives you the chance to either go with what's ever installed from the factory or uh, roll immediately with the uh, newest firmware. And this is also configured on which drives, either the 18 or 20 terabyte drives that are uh, populated in the system. So with that file in place, you can either move through, install it, or continue with what's uh, already installed on the two controllers. And it's set up like similar, uh, it's set up like past versions of uh, these types of arrays where you have an active and a um, uh, backup firmware, so it allows you to stage uh, firmware updates or if something terrible happens, roll back to uh, a previous firmware revision. With that in place, you now go towards your uh, network settings. Um, and in this case, this box already had some IPv4 um, configurations in place, so when you could set it, this is gonna be skipped for uh, this stage of the process. Now you can use a NTP server or manually adjust the uh, date and time. In this case, we're rolling with uh, manually addressed uh, time, and then you can go through and configure your uh, user settings. So here, um, this is already set up, so we're gonna go uh, again, go and uh, skip this step, but you're able to configure those things as you need to for your environment. Your next step is uh, set up your notifications. Okay, so now we're on to the stage where we're doing uh, storage configuration. You can collect, uh, you can select some easy buttons, so high, highest capacity, high sequential performance, or if you prefer manually adjusting your uh, disk groups and ray types, you can configure a, a manual option. And a lot of this just comes down to the type of uh, disk group sizes and uh, provisioning that optimize certain configurations. Um, the manual settings, you can go in and uh, really dive into either if you want to adapt um, now RAID 6, RAID 5, RAID 1, RAID 10, I mean, really anything of uh, what you, you might want to go into if a specific environment requires it, uh, but most users are probably gonna fall back onto uh, one of those uh, default easy button configurations. So in this case, for performance testing, we're going with the high sequential performance setting and then click uh, continue. Um, now we're on to, uh, we see what the uh, spare capacity is for this given pool and we can apply and uh, continue moving through. So with the storage configured, now it comes down to the stage where you see the, init the, background, initializ the background initialization happening, and then you can go through and uh, start provisioning LUNs and volumes to uh, hosts connected onto the platform. Okay, we, so we start off with um, the first stage of creating a host, uh, so you can start having host provision to a given storage device on the system. So here we just create a uh, Linux uh, host name and we'll have the initiators of the discovered uh, SAS connections. And uh, next stage is uh, moving on to uh, creating a volume to then attach to that host. So here we have some volumes on the system and uh, from here we can immediately select one or more that are going to be configured onto or connected onto that system and review those settings. Each of these are 172 terabytes and we'll uh, push that setting through. And at this point, um, the configuration is done. Uh, now we'll go and fall back to the dashboard, but it, in a couple of minutes really, uh, you've gone through from a uh, completely blank system and start provisioning storage onto connected hosts. So here you can see we have some alerts for um, disconnected network uh, ethernet connection. We can bypass those alerts, but overall, I mean, 
a very, very easy setup uh, that doesn't require a lot of uh, pre-existing knowledge to get up and running. So we've talked a lot about the hardware, the resiliency, the design of the platform, and then we took a quick look at the GUI to get a feel for how you deploy this system and how simple that is. Another key component and a key tenant with uh, Seagate and the design of this system is security. So all the hard drives are SED. That gives you another layer of security at the data level, at the drive level. Safe and secure data is the name of the game these days. So those features plus others Seagate has in the Exos Core Vault are really fundamental to a variety of the popular use cases. As we take a look at performance, we did do just a brief amount of testing here to validate Seagate spec sheet on the uh, Exos Core Vault's overall platform performance. And what's really interesting here is our numbers actually exceed their spec sheet numbers, which is always a uh, pleasant surprise when, when it comes to testing. The first workload we looked at was one meg sequential with a 16 Q depth. On the read side, we were seeing over 15 gig a second out of the system and on the right side, a hair below 14. Overall, super impressive for those large block transfers. We decided also to take a look at uh, 8K sequential transfers as well to see what the impact would be of the little blocks. And on that side, we saw about 5 gig read and a little more than 2 write. We'll talk a little bit more about use cases in a second, but the streaming of, of reads and writes sequential, big block especially, in and out of this box, is really where the bulk of the workloads are going to sit. So to know that we can get 15 gig read out of this is really impressive and more than probably what most people are going to need. Now talking about use cases, of course, there are many that you can leverage uh, to go with 106 drives of, uh, of storage. Big media and entertainment uh, file shares or file shares in general, popular use case. Backup and recovery, of course. This platform is certified with a number of providers. Uh, Veeam's one of them. We talked with Veeam about this and they love backing up to Core Vault, not just because of its capacious uh, availability, but also because of the resiliency that the storage provides. So when you think about backup and recovery, Having a lower cost backup target makes a lot of sense, but you want that data to be there should the time come when you have to call upon it. And perhaps an unsuspecting use case is around AI and ML. If you're going to make the investment in expensive GPUs and workloads like generative AI and, and everything that comes along with that, being able to keep these GPUs churning along with a big chunk of data from Exos Core Vault is another really great use case. We've also talked to Filecoin about Exos Core Vault. If you know Filecoin, it's a blockchain that incentivizes capacity being put out there on the web. Their data center partners absolutely love this thing. So what this does is it lets them cost effectively share out these large chunks of storage to researchers and others that are exploring Web3 as a viable opportunity for them rather than more expensive traditional cloud-based infrastructure. Another Seagate Exos Core Vault partner is OS Nexus. Now, Core Vault already provides five nines of availability. When you layer some software on top of it, like OS Nexus, what they can deliver is their additional data resiliency on top of that. They get up to six nines uh, by offering Core Vault as a fundamental part of their overall infrastructure. So in the end, we've got a 106 drive chassis in 4U, extremely dense, that is able to service all sorts of storage needs and is also super resilient, way more than any JBOD could be. The controllers are hot swappable, the fans, the drives, all the componentry inside. And with all of this capacity, with all of this functionality and capabilities, the next question is, what does this thing cost? That's the best part about it. Now Seagate's got a TCO calculator, we'll link to that in the description. That's a really good way to start to look at what their cost is and compare it with other options. But what you should know is that these systems start at 65K and then of course scale based on capacity. But these systems are not that expensive. And if you're looking at large JBODs now and attaching them to server heads, this is absolutely something that should be on your list of considerations. So as big as Core Vault is at over two petabytes today and over three petabytes when the next gen drives come out, don't get trapped into thinking that it's an expensive chassis that's only for the big cloud providers. That's absolutely not the case. We've got a link to the report that we wrote about uh, Seagate Exos Core Vault in the description and check out the TCO calculator. I think you'll be really impressed with what Seagate has to offer here and it should definitely be on the menu for any data center refresh that you're looking at or expansion when it comes to big data storage.